So thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm here in uh, rainy Los Angeles. So I'd be safe and warm if I was out of Los Angeles. Anyway, that's an old song. So um, we're going to speak on the topic of love and the Beatles saying, all you need is love. You probably some of you know that. Oh, could you, if you're sort of blocking everyone, I was sort of looking at everybody, you're, yeah. Yeah, you're like, I can't see anyone except you actually. There you go. Um, of course, I come from perhaps the world capital of uh, superficial loving. Um, and so, so, and you hear all the time, people all the time, they'll say like, oh, you're just in your head. It's just about your heart. And so somehow there's this duality nowadays where it's kind of like totally uncool to be intelligent and you should just be in your heart and not your brain and so on and so forth. So I would like to, basically what I'm going to try to convince you of, I hope you're predisposed to agree, but in any case, what I'm going to try to convince you of is that uh, a healthy life, a good life involves a, um, a balance between your heart and your brain. And, uh, well, I'll start out. Uh, we, I'm sure we've all had the experience of being in a relationship. You know, it could be the romantic relationship or just friendship or siblings, you know, brothers and sisters or with just relationships where uh, we were deeply disappointed or hurt. I mean, I'm sh and um, so what's actually happening? Uh, if you say it's just about your heart, as we, as we should know, anyone that's over, I guess, like nine years old should know that our hearts sometimes lead us astray. Sometimes, for example, two people have real affection for each other but the relationship falls apart. Why? Because they don't really understand how to express love for another person. They don't understand what that person's needs are. They may not understand their own needs. They just may not understand uh, how to sustain a relationship. And yet they started out with you know, the best of intentions, as they say, the. Uh, what do they say? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So, and, and we are thinking creatures, or for example, we, I'm sure there are a, a, quite a number of terrorists in the world that commit all kinds of atrocities, you know, rape and murder and torture, and they believe they're doing it out of their love of God. So that's another problem. What about in the religious domain, people that commit atrocities out of, quote unquote, the highest love, beyond human love, love of God. So given the, uh, the dangers of this world and the fact that we are never very far away from Suffering. I mean, even if we have good lives, I think I have a very good life, but due to the nature of this world, uh, our vulnerability, our physical vulnerability, I mean, you know, God forbid the roof could fall in. G given, given our physical vulnerability to disease, to, out to the aggression of other people, to physical calamity, and given our emotional vulnerability, you know, we have, uh, all of us sort of, do our best to construct a life where we um, we agree to have relationships with some people and, you know, and then other people we choose not to have relationships. Some people seek our friendship and we think, I don't want to go there. It's not healthy for me. And we may seek the friendship of other people that don't accept us. And then when it gets to the point of attachment and, and you could say what people call love, 
the stakes are even higher because if you're rejected, if you're rebuffed, or if you're taken advantage of, it can cause severe emotional pain. And, and so physically and emotionally, we're very vulnerable. It's a very dangerous world. And the, the boundary between our present life and really serious suffering physically or mentally can be very thin, it can be a very thin boundary. And so therefore, uh, we have to lead our lives very carefully. One of the reasons there's so much suffering in the world is because there's so much thoughtlessness in the world and people don't really understand what they're doing and what the consequences are. So, you know, we could multiply examples, but I think it's clear that the deepest love also involves the deepest understanding. When I was a kid, there was a very popular song that went to number one. It was sung by a group called the Teddy Bears, who I'm sure are among your favorites. I'm sure you listen to them every day. But the Teddy Bears had this song called To Know Him Is To Love Him. To know, know, know him is to love, love, love him. And I do. So, but the idea here is that can you really love in ignorance? If you think you love somebody, but you don't really understand them, and therefore you're headed for a train wreck, um, did you really love that person? There's this great line in uh, Mansfield Park by Jane Austen, where, uh, that's our lady, Jane Austen. There's this great line where, uh, Edmund Bertram, the hero, finally understands that this very this beautiful woman he was so attached to uh, was not really who he thought she was. Wait, who he thought she was. And then he, he has this realization, which is very old, I'm sure we've all had this, that the person I loved was just a creation of my own mind. I fell in love with the person that I had created in my mind. And now that I see the real person, oh my God. It's like, I mean, imagine someone's like really drunk at a party and they spend the night with some other person and then they wake up sober. It's like, you know, it's sort of like uh, buyer's remorse, you know, or the, oh my God, did I take this thing home? <laughs> <laughs> so, as we know, I mean, this is science now. There was a movie called What the Bleep, and uh, we never actually found out what the bleep was, but in that movie, they had this one scene where um, they showed scientifically that when we become attached, especially in a... Um, a, a, a sexual relationship, and by that I don't mean people are actually necessarily having sex, but I mean there's that kind of attraction, there's sexual attraction. And um, that the body starts producing this drug. I'm sure you all know this, you know, they're called love endorphins. And so if you are trying to make a rational decision about should I have a relationship with this person, how far should I go, and how much should I commit myself uh, emotionally, physically? How far should I commit myself? Uh, often people are literally DUI. They are driving under the influence of a drug. And just like if you're drunk or stoned, as we used to say, then you're obviously not going to drive very well. So if, you, if your body is producing these endorphins, you are not going to make a rational decision. You will... and. Um, quote a great song by this old group called The Platters. Uh, this, there was a song called Love, uh, Smoke It's In Your Eyes. I actually bought the 45 when I was a little kid. I really liked that song. But, but one of the lines in that song is uh, that my friend, they said one day you'll find that all who love are blind. And so, I mean, there, I, I'm not trying to convince you there's no true love in the world or that you should not seek true love. I'm simply saying that it's a minefield, and if you take one wrong step, you can blow up emotionally. And so, uh, 
I think all these examples should be sufficient to convince us that we really need to use our God-given brains. Because if by heart we mean just, you know, if it feels good, do it. Uh, there are literally an infinite number of examples where that led to catastrophe in someone's life. So, again, that question, uh, can, you love, can you love someone if you don't really understand, if you don't really know them? Can you love someone you don't really know? I think the answer is no, you cannot. What, you're, what we're loving in that case is what we hope the person is or want the person to be. We're not loving the actual person. So, or for example, I mean, my mother, I remember uh, I, had, I, had a really, I had really great parents, but anyway, I was born in LA and um, my mother used to tell this story because she was, she was born on a ranch in Riverside, California. Now it's a big metropolitan area, but back then it was just a little, it was just sort of a ranch town. And so she, anyway, she grew up on a ranch in Riverside, California. And um, when she had her first child, it was my older brother, uh, she used to laugh at herself and say that when he was really young, little baby, he, he got a fever and she got so excited and so, you know, concerned that she, she took him outside into the cool air to cool him down. Now, obviously, that's not plan A for helping a child with a fever, that you take the child with a fever out into the cold air to cool down his fever. At the same time, there's absolutely no question that this mother really loved her child. She really loved her child, but heart was not enough. There, there has to be some understanding. There has to be intelligence also. So, um, so if we take this whole discussion, if we take this whole discussion of the need to use your God-given brain and your heart, because if we're just all analytic and we can't feel, you know, we can't really, I'll give you an example of that. There's a, there's a famous Brahmin couple in this ancient text called Mahabharata. Uh, there was a young couple and they were both yogis. I mean, really, this was thousands of years ago and they were real yogis. I mean, nowadays, anyway, I won't go into that, what they call yoga, but these were real yogis. These were real yogis. And they wanted to have a child, but they wanted to have a divine child. And so they, 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 through yoga, they wanted to get themselves into this very high state of consciousness. They performed all these austerities, severe austerities in terms of fasting and self-denial of every kind so that they could elevate their consciousness, completely take their consciousness off the physical body, focus it on the soul, which by the way is that's the whole point of um, uh, Pratyahara, Dharma, if you know Ashtanga Yoga. Basically, in Ashtanga Yoga, the first four are sort of preparation. Yama Niyama, just different moral principles you follow, different little practices. And then uh, Pranayama or Asana. Because if you're going to meditate for many years, as people did, you're going to get really serious cramps. And so the body, the body had to be conditioned just so you could sit down for long periods of time. That's why they did the asanas. It was so that they could sustain a, a long practice sitting down and, and stay healthy. So preliminary moral principles and then asana, you learn how to sit properly to keep your body well conditioned and then you control your breathing. So at that point, you're ready to start the actual yoga in the sense you're ready to start the actual practice of raising consciousness and so at that point the first thing you do is called pratyahara uh this is the ashtanga anga, anga in sanskrit just means stages or steps or parts so ashta is ocho eight so ashta anga ashtanga just means eight eight steps or eight parts so uh, it's in the fifth step that you really begin to work on consciousness itself directly. 
So the fifth step is called Pratyahara. Prati in Sanskrit is a handy little prefix, which means uh, something like counter, like a countermeasure or counteraction and so on, counter. Like something, like a force comes and then, and then you counter it and, and it's like a counter force. And so Ahara, Ahara in Sanskrit means um, something like uh, taking in. It's just like, for example, the word consume in English can mean literally eating like he consumed the whole cake. Or the word, we now use the word consume to mean basically the enjoyment or the or the use of anything like like how much how much let's say uh paper is consumed in america or you know how much iron ore is consumed every year by american industry and so consume can mean anything like that just the, you know using something so that's something like the sanskrit word ahara ahara is something like that it means engaging something, using it, consuming it. And so in that sense, pratyahara, the fifth stage of yoga, counter consumption or counter utilization. What that means, the prati, the counter, is that our senses naturally go out into the world. That uh, if we hear a sound, it, it, our, our consciousness goes to that sound. If we see something or smell or taste or touch something. And so consciousness, is what what happens is that that, that uh, experiences like taste, sound, or images, aromas are constantly coming into our consciousness, to our senses, and then our consciousness goes out into the world through those same senses to explore those sensations or to explore those experiences. And so that's sort of the natural state of life where your consciousness is going out into the world. And the world is coming into your consciousness, <clears throat> and that's the ahara. By the way, that that's that's what the ahara refers to. Pratyahara means reversing that. It means reverse. It means something like reverse ahara. And what that means is, you take your consciousness and you focus it inside. So rather than consciousness streaming out into the world. You reverse that and, and, and you focus it back into the world. Similarly, all these sights and sounds and smells and touches and tastes, I got the fire there. All these, all these sensations that are streaming into your consciousness, you also reverse that and you kind of send them back out so that you don't pay attention to those things and your consciousness is going within. Obviously, this is a necessary step to meditate, seriously. Because if, you know, you're trying to meditate and you also want to answer every text in real time, uh, it's not going to be a great meditation. Unless you're trying to meditate on texting. So, Pratyahara, which is the fifth stage of yoga, is a necessary process to just kind of like, you know, clear the deck and, and let's meditate. So then the sixth stage is dharana. Dharana literally means hang on. It's like hanging on, holding on to it. Because, you know, if you, your entire life, and it's true for all of us, our entire lives, our consciousness has been streaming out into the world and the world has been streaming into our mind through our senses. And so when you reverse that, you may do it for like a second, but then it's going to like snap back into what it's been doing your whole life. Like that clown you punch and it bounces back up. And so therefore, after Pratyahara, you have the next stage, Dharana, which means you have to hold it. You have to not only focus the consciousness within, you actually have to hold it there. And, th and that's what dharna means. Uh, then the seventh stage is uh, dhyana, meditation. Then you can actually meditate. Obviously, you can't really meditate if your mind's all over the place. 
So then you meditate, and when your meditation becomes perfect, it's called samadhi. The word samadhi, you may have heard this word samadhi, it's a yoga word. Uh, it's a Sanskrit word, actually. It's composed of three semantic elements, which are sam, a, and d. And sam, uh, we have in English still, the word, the sum and samadhi we still have, uh, through the Greek as uh, sin, S-Y-N, not sin in the sense of S-I-N, but like synthesis. Like in the word synthesis, it just means the complete thesis. You have the thesis, antithesis, and when you bring everything together, it's the synthesis. It's the together thesis. Or in sankirtan, kirtan means chanting, and when everyone chants together, that's called sankirtan. So, sum means complete in that sense. So it's a meditation which is complete, which is thorough. Ah, in Sanskrit in this case, means to bring something within, or it can be an intensifier, and D means to place. So, so sum ah D literally means placing the mind, intensely placing the mind in its proper object, or on its proper object, which is of course the object of your meditation, which is the absolute truth of God. So, so going back to the love thing, the, you know, the heart and brain thing, um, Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, in Bhagavad Gita, which is the most important and ancient philosophical text on, on yoga, um, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are also famous. Uh, Patanjali assumes that you understand what is called Sankhya philosophy. Uh, if you look at the ancient Indian schools of, uh, of practice or paths to liberation, they're, they're basically grouped into pairs. So you have Sankhya and Yoga. You have Sankhya and Yoga which have historically from ancient times been a pair. And so Sankhya and Yoga means something like philosophy and practice. Something like philosophy and practice. And um, so in the Yoga Sutras by Patanjali, he is really concerned with the practice. Yoga meaning practice in this context. And he assumes that you know the Sankhya philosophy. We know he assumes that because he, he often uses these terms without defining them. He just assumes you know what these words mean. And he uses them exactly in the way they're used in Sankhya. Now, Krishna says something interesting in Bhagavad Gita using the term Sankhya and Yoga. Krishna says, Sankhya Yoga Prakat Bala Pravadanti Napandita Ekma Pyasti Tak Samya Gubayor Vindate Pala. Which means, Krishna says, only the immature. Actually, the word he uses for immature is bala, which means child, literally. So he says, literally, the childish. Only people who are childish claim, claim, pravadanti, only the childish claim that philosophy and practice are different. And of course, the words there are sankhya and yoga, that philosophy and practice are different. Ekama pi asitak samya. Because if you practice even one of them very well, then you get the results of both. So if you say yoga, like bhakti yoga especially, is trying to give your heart and then Sankhya's philosophy, Krishna says if you really understand the knowledge, your heart will open and you will completely embrace the spiritual path on that level and if you really open your heart you're going to want to understand what you opened your heart to and it's just like for example when people are falling in love with each other what do they talk about but themselves right and uh they never tire of talking about themselves and, and the other person wants to hear i want to know all about you and so when you really open your heart to something you want to understand it and if you really understand something which is lovable, then that opens your heart. And so again, even that Krishna's discussion of Sankhya and Yoga, philosophy of practice, relates to our whole heart and brain thing. But also, so, so the point I wanted to make is that, that because Patanjali assumes that you know Sankhya, he assumes you know this ancient philosophy, 
Um, he doesn't go into it very much. He, he just uses the jargon of it. But in Bhagavad Gita, you actually get the philosophical understanding. Bhagavad Gita gives us the whole roadmap, the whole understanding. This is why we're doing yoga. This is the ultimate goal. For example, Patanjali says, uh, famously, Patanjali says in the Yoga Sutras that um, Samadhi Siddhir Ishwara Pranidhanat. That um, Samadhi, of course, I've explained, it's the highest stage of yoga, the Ashtanga Yoga, it's the eighth stage of yoga. And Siddhi means perfection. So when Patanjali says the perfection of Samadhi, in effect, he's saying the perfection of the perfection of yoga. So what's the perf how do you get the perfection of the perfection of yoga, according to, some, according to Patanjali? Ishwara Pranidhana, by devoting yourself to God. So uh, uh, Patanjali uses the word Ishwara, which means the Lord, the Lord or God, but he doesn't talk about it. There's, there's not very much theology in the Yoga Sutras. With theology, of course, just meaning the logos, the rational explanation of theos, of God. So you don't get much theology, but he uses the word Ishwara. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna actually, actually explains what the word means. When we talk about the Lord and we talk about God, here's what we're really talking about. He goes into it at, at a very philosophical, sophisticated level. It's not just like, you know, a book for kind of mindless, true believers. Krishna gives serious philosophy. So, um, that being the case, uh, Krishna, you, Krishna uses a very interesting term in Bhagavad Gita, which is buddhi yoga. Buddhi yoga. And uh, the word yoga, you know, in, 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 in ancient philosophy, yoga basically means a, a spiritual practice. I mean, the word yoga can mean many things. It's used a lot because it has to do with process and practice and functionality and connection. And so it, it goes all over the place semantically. But, but when you get to its core meaning in, philo in, in philosophical or spiritual discourse, it really means something like spiritual practice. And therefore, for example, jnana yoga, the, the spiritual practice of jnana or knowledge or karma yoga, turning your ordinary actions, karma, into a spiritual practice. That's what karma yoga means. And so Krishna introduces a key term, buddhi yoga. It's a very important term. I mean, in my Bhagavad Gita infomercial, uh, we printed about, we published Bhagavad Gita about a year ago and it's available. So in Krishna, in the Bhagavad Gita, as I explained, Krishna uses this word buddhi a lot. Now the word buddhi comes from the same Sanskrit root as the word Buddha, as in Buddhism. So Buddha or Buddhi are formed from a Sanskrit root, Budh, B-U-D-H, which means to be aware or become aware, to awaken, or in that sense, enlightenment. And, and, and also though, it, it's a word that means to reason, to reason to analyze things intelligently and come to objective conclusions about what things really are. So when Krishna says buddhi yoga, what he actually means is a spiritual practice based on just being intelligent, you know, using your brain and being reasonable. It's not that there's no heart in it. There's a lot of heart in it because ultimately Krishna gives, as a synonym of buddhi yoga, he gives bhakti yoga. So Krishna says the yoga of love, the yoga of devotion, can also be called the yoga of being a rational human being. And he says these are actually the same process, which is, which is quite interesting, I think. I mean, that, to me, that's, uh, that's interesting. So, of course, you should also find it interesting because I do, right? And because I have the microphone. But anyway... Um, you know, in, interestingly, in, in the very, very famous verse in Bhagavad Gita 10.10, 10, Krishna says, uh, Te shang satata yukta nam bhajatam priti purvakam tadami buddhi yogam tang jena te. Krishna says, for them, 
or for those people, Teishan, for those people, Satata Jukanam were always connected, always connected to me. It's like if you love someone, you always want to be connected, either, you know, by social media or you call or Skype or you actually meet the person. So, or you just remember them. So if you think about it, when you're really in love, when you're really in love, in your mind, you're never disconnected. And when people mutually love, then it actually works. So, but that's what it means. When you love someone, when you're in love with someone, you never really forget them. There's always that connection. And when you start forgetting them most of the time, then, you know, the, the fire is, uh, fire is uh, going out. So, anyway, Krishna says, for those people who are always connected to me, Teishang Satata Juktanam, the word yukta, by the way, is from the same root as the word yoga. So if the word yoga means link or spiritual practice, the word yukta means one who is in a practice, one who is linked, like linked, L-I-N-K-E-D. It's like, so if yoga means connection, yukta means connected. So obviously, if you're practicing connection, never get connected, it's, it's not working. It's like I remember when I was a kid, you'd see these people with the lawnmowers, you know, where they pull the cord. To, you know, sometimes they'd be there like, they drive you nuts. They'd be there like half the day trying to start their lawnmowers. So the idea is if you're practicing connection, and that's what yoga means, practicing connection, then yukta means you are connected. You actually connected. So Krishna says, those who are satata yuktanam, always connected to me. Bhajatam Priti Purvakam, worshiping me with 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 love. The word love there is Priti. The word Priti, which is actually connected to our English word pleasure. And uh, so Priti, those who are connected to me, who love me, Krishna says, I give them something, Dadami. I give them something by which they can actually come to me. They can come back to God. To their real life, and so what? And so what does Krishna give them? What is? And these are the big winners in Bhagavad Gita. They're always connected. They love. They love Krishna. So what does Krishna give them that empowers them to, to come back? Krishna says, "I give them buddhi yoga. I show them how they can actually carry out in practice." Pure intelligence. I mean, like, let's say, for example, someone wants to be in a relationship, or they're, you know, they 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 just want to be in love with somebody. And so you meet someone, and if you're if you're smart, and you know what you're doing, you're obviously going to, as they say, check out that person. Is this going to lead to pleasure or pain? Is this going to lead to love or betrayal? And if you don't check that out, then you're, you know, you're kind of uh, a really good candidate for a lot of misery. So, so again, what is the relationship between our intelligence and our, and our, and our brain and our heart? We have feelings, we have emotions, and we should. I mean, you know, we're alive, we're, we're persons. Someone that has no feelings is, you know, is kind of something wrong there. We should have feelings. We should have emotions. However, we have to keep them within boundaries. Give one simple example. One of the emotions we sometimes feel is anger. And, you know, there is a kind of righteous anger. There are moments in which anger is justified and even healthy. And obviously some anger is not healthy. Some anger is not justified. So. But again, when someone becomes angry, I know like little kids, they say like, I'm going to knock your teeth out. This may be a guy thing. I mean, I don't let girls say to each other, I'm going to knock your teeth out. But uh, young boys certainly say this to each other all the time. And I never saw anyone's teeth actually got knocked out when I was growing up. But I saw that warning issued thousands of times. So, I mean, that's just one example. Sometimes we become angry, but there have to be boundaries. We know, okay, I'm angry. 
But if I actually cause physical harm to this person, I'm going to destroy my life, first of all. And secondly, I'm going to do something which is ultimately immoral. Or, I mean, I mean, let's say, for example, a man is attracted to a woman. You could say, okay, that's natural, that's normal. But if, if the desire becomes too strong, it becomes stalking, it, you know, in, in the... And ultimately, you know, in, in the worst cases, it can become rape and even murder. I mean, we all know about the real world out there. So, again, if you take typical emotions like attraction to the opposite sex, anger, jealousy, or even the desire to be with somebody, like, you know, why did you lock me up in this cage up in the mountains so that no one can ever find me again? I didn't want to lose you. You know, so you can take any normal human emotion, which within proper measure could even be seen as healthy. And if it breaks its boundaries, if, if it goes too far, it becomes unhealthy and ultimately criminal and evil if it's taken too far and so and so therefore obviously our emotions which we should have i mean if, you, if you're if you're alive if you're a person you have feelings you have emotions but they have to stay within reasonable boundaries so that those feelings don't become pathological and ultimately criminological So again, there's this balance. Now, what about our relationship with God? Finally, we, we trot out our, you know, our main product, our specialty item, Krishna. So, you know, what about in the spiritual life? What about in our relationship with God? Um, again, when people are falling in love with each other, they want to know all about each other, not only as a precaution, but also because when you're attracted to some somebody, everything about them is interesting to you. You know, when someone's really falling in love, the other person could say something like, hey, the sky is blue today. And oh my God, that was so poetic. I love the way you said that. Anyway, uh, you know, sometimes so-called love can shut the brain off, but if somehow, somehow or other you can keep your brain on, keep it in the on position, then, um, how can you love the unknown? I mean, you think about it. If God for us is the great unknown, and we just know that God is great, you know, but the, which is kind of a contradiction in terms, because if God is unknown, how do you know he's great? So there's something at the very least paradoxical about the term the great unknown. But then again, philosophy is has gone the way of the dodo bird, in our culture, it's basically extinct. And therefore people say all kinds of things which sound deep and nice, but when you under scrutiny, it turns out they're just speaking nonsense. Like for one of my favorites is, oh yeah, uh, the universe helped me and I got a new job, something like that. Or couldn't find my car keys when the universe you know, showed me where my car, I mean, I'm giving kind of like, somewhat facetious examples, but it's become very common in our culture to attribute agency, which means the power to act. It's become very common to attribute agency to the universe. Now, keep in mind that your natural toothpaste is part of the universe. And also all the uh, industrial waste products in Gary, Indiana are also part of the universe and all the planets and asteroids and uh, I mean, everything's part of the universe. So therefore, if you say the universe helped me, the obvious question would be which part of the universe did it? I mean, it wasn't the industrial waste in Gary, Indiana, was it? Or was it, um, was it my toothpaste? Did my toothpaste help me? Or, or was it all this stuff put together? So it's very interesting because, 
you take a bunch of dead matter and somehow when you get you get enough of it, it, it becomes conscious. It's like that great and greatly ridiculous third Terminator movie, actually Terminatrix, where, you know, at five o'clock on December twelfth, you know, the computers became conscious and it's like it's one of those silly Hollywood scenarios. I mean, it it, it it's it's uh, Blade Runner, it's The Matrix, it's you know Terminator. It's all it's a whole Hollywood genre where computers become conscious. There's like innumerable films like that, all based on the same absurd and false conclusion uh, that dead matter can be conscious. So if you say the universe, if you attribute agency, if you attribute purpose, like benevolence, I mean, the word benevolence, bene, you know, from Latin, like bien in Spanish, it means the good, bene. And volence is like volition, it means wishing. So benevolence literally means wishing the good. Just like to benefit from Latin means to do the good. And benevolence means to wish the good. And so to attribute literally benevolence, a will to do good to the universe. I mean, isn't it people that have will? Isn't it people that have purposes? Isn't it people that choose? No, aren't people. Isn't it people? Yeah, that's okay grammatically. It's actually people. It's actually people who desire to do things. How could you have something which is, and another question, how could something unconscious desire anything? I mean, for example, let's say right now you're sitting on the floor and if I reprimand you and say, hey, you're just using that floor. It's like, yeah, that's right, I'm using the floor. But let's say, let's say you walk into this room and you punch someone, knock them down, and then sit on them and just said, I just, you look comfortable. I mean, obviously, that would everyone would be offended. Everyone would take that as a seriously immoral act. But if you grab a pillow and punch it to get it into your comfort shape and then sit on the pillow, it doesn't bother anyone because it's dead. I mean, it, it's not conscious. It's just dead matter. So when you, when, you, when you claim that the universe is conscious, it has purpose and will, and it's kind of a nice guy, the universe is a nice guy, what are we talking about? What are we actually talking about here? Other than kind of like meaningless heart, no brain talk. So I think that's one of the reasons why uh, keep your brain in the on position. Even when you're having your heart moments, keep your brain turned on. So Anyway, that's the picture. So, so God, can you love God if you don't know God? Or to what extent? To what extent can you love anyone, whether it's anyone? Someone in your family, someone you've went on a date with, uh, a friend, God, a demigod, you know? Can you love anyone or anything that you don't understand? Is it actually love? And what does it mean to give your heart to something that you actually are ignorant of. What does it even mean? So clearly it's in our interest to know God as much as we can. And of course, someone's gonna say, well, you can never know God perfectly. But I mean, the idea that you can never know God, I find to be twisted. I'll tell you why I find it to be twisted. Because imagine a man and a woman that have a child, they beget a child, and for some, well, twisted reason, decide that we will never, ever allow that child to know who we are. They can never see us. Now, there are cases, like let's say, for example, a couple puts up a child for adoption, or one of them puts up a child for adoption. They may think, well, in order to save them from what someone imagines will be, the pain of knowing that these were your parents, you know, whatever. I mean, it's it's usually not a great idea to seal the record so a child can never know who the birth parents are. But sometimes people do that. And it's either done out of some 
out of belief in some psychological theory that somehow psychologically emotion is better for the child not to know or it's done because the parents are really not having a great life in some way. But now, in the, and, and so in the case of, so I think whenever you claim that someone begets someone else, someone brings someone else into the world and then hides from them forever, I think you have to explain why that would be the case. Like, like if I said, yes, I had a child once, but I never allowed the child to see me, you would probably want to know why, like you, there, there must be, there must be some other circumstances. So in the case of God, I don't think we can say that psychologically it would be really bad for us. Uh, I'm going to end soon. Um, it, would be it would be bad for us to see God or know God unless it's like it turns out the way Hollywood believes that all, you know, aliens from other planets with higher powers for some crazy reason all look like reptiles. In the 50s, they used to give us sort of good-looking human-like aliens, but for the last 40 years, all we get is reptiles, which I really can't stand. So, nothing, nothing against reptiles, it's just that why do higher beings always look like reptiles? So, you could say it's, it's better we not see God because oh my, he's a reptile. You know, he's just like the supreme reptile alien. But assuming that's not the case, I don't think there's a good reason why a loving God wouldn't want to reveal himself or herself or themselves, you know, our supreme parents. Why not? let us see them and if, if if the case now is that we're not ready for it or spiritually we're not ready okay but god would want to qualify us for example let's say parents have a child and the child is like totally out of the control like burned the neighbor's house down you know i mean there was this horrible case in west virginia several months ago where these juvenile delinquents just set fire in a west virginia town you know killed like 50 people or something including a lot of children so, I mean, you can imagine a situation where a child is like, you know, psychotic or evil, wants to kill the parents. And so the parents say, well, we can't really hang out with you until you take your medicine or something has to change here. So a plan where first get yourself together and then, yes, you can see God. That makes sense. But the idea that we can never know God, I think, is just is really very bad philosophy as is the idea of attributing agency and benevolence to a blind universe without a personal God. So anyway, uh, love and, you know, love and intelligence together, brain and heart. That's the message. So any questions on this? Let me just take one minute if you have any questions. I would just like to say that we do still call it stone. <laughs> stone? You said that what oh, we used to oh, call stone. stone. Thank you. So I didn't I didn't date myself then. Okay. So there's no question I'd like to thank you all for uh, your patience. And uh hope you have a hope you're having a good time and uh hope we'll see you again sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. All right, for sure. So, uh, thank you also those who are watching on Ustream. I'm going to stop.